Good evening. I'm Sindhu Nair, architect cum journalist, editor of Scale, an online magazine that wishes to tries to bring together inspirational works of art, architecture, and design from around the world. I have with me Mohammed Faraj Al Suwedi, a new generation artist, architect, designer, and animator, who will co-host the show with me. Welcome, Mohammed, and thank you for partnering with Scale. Thank you for having me today. It is a great pleasure to be part of this talk, and I look forward to engaging in a very progressive dialogue with you all today. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. So there are some ground rules for the talk. I've muted everyone except the panelists. We might have, we might face some issues, but please bear with me. We'll be taking questions on the chat, which will be asked to the respective panelists after the session of 40 minutes. I'll introduce each of our participants, give them approximately four to five minutes to give us a context of the work they are involved in. They can share slides, screens, to make the audience aware of what they are involved in, more about their work. Scale is privileged to host experts in the field of public art from Qatar and India, who have helped put the focus on art and creativity amongst the masses to instigate, to discuss, and in many instances, to elevate the masses, public art and the built environment. Public art, as we all know, is not an art form. While it can be huge or a small installation, abstract, realistic, site-specific, or stand apart in contrast, what makes it special is its essential and unique association with the public. I would like to share screen here. Can you see the screen now? Yes. yes. Okay. So public art is an effective way of way of grabbing attention while imparting subversive social commentary. It can be huge, like this colossal sculpture we have seen resting on Doha's Cornish, measuring a height of about 40 meters. It represents cause attempt to remind passers-by to relax in an increasingly hectic play, hectic world. It's a playful commentary on humanity. And it can even be small, like this, uh, like this small yet strong message positioned in front of the famed charging bull statue within New York's financial district, Fearless Girl, a defi defiant and unapologetic statement against gender equality by Euro European sculptor Kristin Lisbar. It can be right in the middle of all the public, uh, like this heart squared uh, public installation in New York's New York and it's called a cloud of steel and mirrors that interact with viewers. Public is, uh, public is encouraged to come and view their own uh, profiles, interact with it. And that is how public art interacts with the public. And then there are some which are site specific, which are created for a certain purpose, like how Nendo has created this experience of raindrops and flowers budding in an, at an iconic French department store. Public art usually seeks to convey some message, either social, political, or societal, and even religious in olden times, and they help define an area and its inhabitants or both. Public art usually has a profound impact on people and their actions. It can uplift societies. Entire segments of underprivileged can feel integrated and respected. Um, Mahmoud, over oh, to you. Thank you. Uh, so Qatar Museums also has a dedicated arm for public art, and also works of local and international artists um, that can also be used to be integrated into the fabric of the land, pushing the locals and also the residents to interact with. This art form and to also think that it's meaning and also that can also be site specific as well. Richard Sira's East West is one of the art forms that elevated that isolated spot in the desert to much visited tourism and destination as well. Our first participant in QM's head of public art, Abdurrahman Ishaq, Salam Alaikum who will take us through other, uh, Qatar's public art projects. Welcome to this session, Abdurrahman. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with everyone. Um, I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm gonna take you across all the public art, but uh, I think part of the, um, 
mystique or by part of the interest of uh, public art is that people, the public, go and see them and experience them themselves. Um, what we do in uh, public uh, in uh, Qatar museums, uh, we do give a huge attention to the public art uh, part. It, uh, we consider public art um, uh, an open museum, and it's very important because it, it's you know. Uh, you bring out the, uh, what is uh, inside the museum to the public. So it is very critical. We think it's very um, uh, political as well as sometimes. Uh, it has commentary and it reflects a lot of uh, what the society in large uh, uh, has to say about the, uh, itself. So we do uh, give a big attention about it. Um, we do, uh, we have a lot of public art installed right now in Doha. We're working towards 2022 with uh, more projects, um, which uh, will be surprises, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think this is one of the questions that we also received once. Um, so which was one of the first public art projects of QM and how did it also expand since? I don't know. I don't know which one was the first one, to be honest. Um, <laughs> one of the first uh, projects that made an impact is the teddy bear, which you have on the screen. Um, I think that was a, a, a benchmark, really, to the, for the airport. Um, it, it received criticism at the beginning, but it proved itself with time, and it became an icon of Doha. Um, uh, another one is, of course, uh, the Richard Sale. It had a big impact. Uh, on what uh, Doha is. The first one, it's hard to say. Mm. It's, hard, it's hard, very hard to say. We have all public art in Doha. Um, in some way or, other, or another, uh, other museums have been involved in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um. Okay, my, uh, my first association with, uh, I'll introduce Laila next. My first association with Laila, Laila Ibrahim Basha, a senior art specialist at Qatar Foundation was when she took us around the Sidra project. Do you remember that, Laila? Yeah, so to see yeah, artworks, yeah. yes, yeah, so to see the artworks within Sidra, the medical school. I see her as a person who has humanized art forms in uh, QF, engaging the public in walks, and talks, making the art forms much more uh, accessible by telling the public about their stories. Uh, Laila, can you tell us about the public artwork uh, that QF is involved with? Can you take us through some of yes. this? Yes, sure. Um, just give me a second until I share my screen. Uh, here we go. Share. OK, I think it's working. Yes, yes it is. It is. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sindhu, again for having me uh, and with um, with this distinguished guests. Um, I'll just going to talk about the art in education city. I can see that the audience is quite international, so maybe it's good to get just to give an idea of background of education city and Qatar Foundation. Um, so, for those who don't know, Education City is the campus, is the physical space of Qatar Foundation. It's not like uh, any usual campus. We have schools and universities, of course, but also we have national libraries, we have a hospital, we have equestrian center, we have a golf course, research center. It's quite diverse. It's like a city within a city. Um, and in, in Education City, we have museums, so, and we have uh, art galleries for temporary art exhibitions, and we have a public artwork collection that is on display in all the buildings around Education City. Um, and I will always um, say that the specific specificity of this collection is um, comes from uh, the building, it's, the buildings are uh, themselves. So uh, most of our buildings are designed by internationally known architects. And uh, whenever we commission an art piece, we have to look into several factors. First of all, those architects comes with their architectural concept. And you all know how they are very you know, uh, unique and the design brief that we really need to align with. And then you have the functionality of the building because curating an artwork for a hospital is different than curating an artwork for 
a, um, a national library, for example. Um, and then you have the whole theme from QF art and the criteria that we have to, you know, kind of tick boxes and make sure that we are aligned uh, with the messages of Qatar Foundation. And the collection in a whole has no gaps and everything is in harmony together. Um, uh, here I have uh, just in front of you an example how we worked uh, in very closely with uh, Rem Kulhas, uh, the very famous architect uh, on the Qatar National Library artwork, which was a quote from the Quran, uh, represent Nun wa Qalamu wa Maisturun, it's about uh, writing and reading. Um, and then we have another example here, which is um, in the EC Mosque building, where we worked with, uh, it's designed by uh, Manjera and Ivars architects uh, from Spain. And they provided, as you can see, a wall that has a texture. And we uh, commissioned Munir al Fatimi to do an artwork inspired by uh, the Book of Perfection, uh, which represents um, um, uh, which is very important in Islamic algebra history. Um, so, um, going back to what she said about humanizing, I really like this part of uh, communicating with the public and making those artwork ac accessible. People ask how we make this artwork accessible. Um, so for us, uh, we do a lot of tours, public tours to, to the public, but also we, we work a lot on the education of, uh, of those artworks, like the educational part of these artworks. We have a lot of school visits um, that comes to uh, the buildings um, and uh, we, we kind of make it as a, a link between uh, school students and the university that are in the campus. Um, so for them, they can see in the future where they can go and have a link through this artwork. So it's kind of informal way to make the connection uh, to those buildings and to those universities. Another example is um, we, we work with the university students. We give them a chance to, um, to participate in exhibition production. And, uh, and here we have an example of Osman al Khanji exhibition where VCU um, graphic design and inter interior design students who participated in the uh, exhibition production itself. Um, and it's very important for us to showcase the heritage of Qatar because we are in a campus and we have more than 40 nationalities uh, presented in this uh, campus. So uh, showing the um, Arab and Qatari heritage is very important. Again, through the artwork in an informal way. On the right side, you have the uh, Abdullah Akkar artwork, which is inspired by the suspended poems, which is a very important part in the uh, Arab literature um, history. And on the left side, we have Shirin Gurgis, inspired by Ben Al-Qasra, novel by Najib Mahfouz. And then uh, I'll show you the latest. Uh, artwork that we have unveiled last year in 2019 to show that we don't only focus on local, uh, we don't only focus on um, Arabs uh, art artists, but also international. Um, we had the chance to have uh, Maqbul Fida Hussain, who's uh, known by the Castle of India, to be invited by her Highness Sheikha Moza at the end of his life, the chairperson of Qatar Foundation, to create a collection of work related to art and Islamic heritage. And this artwork that you have in front of you is kind of one of a kind installation. It's the latest artwork that he made. Um, he worked on it in 2008, 2009. He unfortunately died in 2009, uh, 2011 while doing the production of the artwork. And we finally finished the um, you know, finalize the artwork in 2019 and it's now ready uh, to receive the public. So I invite you all coming to Doha to come and see this wonderful art installation. It's a 20 minute show um, that I cannot describe that you really need like all public artworks as Abdurrahman said, you need to come and visit it in person to experience it. And if you want to join any of the art public art tours, you can just drop an email to the art trail um, email address. If I have any question, contact me, send me a message on Instagram, and I'm all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. We'll come back. Yeah. Um, now we'll come back. Uh, we'll go to Bose Krishnamachari, a name who is not uh, a person who's not unknown in India and on the international stage. Artist, independent curator. Rose Krishnamachari lives and works between Mumbai and Kochi. His, his, uh, 
His diverse artistic and curatorial practice in, includes contemporary art, design, and sciences. He's a co-founder of the Kochi Binale Foundation, and he's a founding president. He was artistic director and co-curator of India's first Binale, the Kochi Musri's Binale 2012. He was director of Kochi Musri's 2014, 2016, 2018, and 2020. Yes, he also curated for an image faster than light, the first edition of the Yinchuan Binale in China. Can you tell us about your role and the challenges that you faced as a curator of the first Binale in Kochi that has uh, garnered uh, worldwide attention as, and is now very well known around the world? Uh, I'll have to unmute. I, I think you have to unmute. So you have to un ah yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry that uh, not the technology. <laughs> thank you all of you. Um, it's wonderful to see um, public art, especially you know I could see old pictures work in Qatar uh, when I was uh, traveling to other other part of the world. Uh, Charities, I would like to talk about the Kochi Musris Binali, Kochi Binal Foundation, initiated the uh, Contemporary Art Festival, uh, International Festival in 2012, uh, co curated by, uh, sorry, uh, I can go to the next slide. Okay. Yeah. So um, when we were thinking about the biennial in 2010, you know, it was the foundation initiated in 2010 and thinking about the Vinale, we didn't have much places to exhibit the work. We can have a, a contemporary art festival. So we have renovated this uh, with the help of the state, the Lentil Academy. Uh, we renovated this first uh, uh, place and it was from 10,000 square feet to now we have about more than 600,000 square feet of exhibition areas inside and outside of Fokochi, which is about uh, Fokochi, Fokochi and Martancheri, which is about 4.5 uh, square kilometer area. Um, and the Bainil is open on 12th of December. We started the first edition of the Binale on 12-12-12 and we were started for 90 days and people's demand we exhibited, we extended the biennial for four more days, which was 94 days and we had more than uh, four, 400,000 people visited the first edition. All our editions, you know, fifth edition we are working on it. This was the fourth edition inaugurated by the Chief Minister of Kerala, Sri Pinarayi Vijayan. And you know, like we have wonderful patrons and ministers and all the public almost the 5,000 you know 7,000 people attend the opening ceremony and we open to the public on 12 12 12 12 o'clock 12 noon open to everyone this Biennale city is known as uh, you know it was declared by the mayor of Cochin on 17th of October 2012 and we have about this when we think about the location and site we have about more than 44 different community lives and work, live and work around Matancheri and Fort Kochi. Um, and also they speak almost 16 different kinds of languages. It's interesting to see that through the trade, we got amazing kind of people come from all parts of the world, uh, Arab, Romans and others. And so when we are thinking about a project like this, uh, people's part Participation is one of the most important aspects of how you can bring uh, people to cultural spaces, how you can bring over to uh, exhibition spaces. The white Cubian spaces converted or you know transformed into kind of non you know, borderless kind of no borders, you know, it's a kind of uh, everywhere you could find art. So we've been students, we have students' programs and things like that, and we uh, this was from the last edition of the Biennial. Uh, we, we, we had artists from uh, Malaysia, Ambru. Uh, they, it was kind of performative performance art. 
come, they, they make a huge prints with the dancing over that, uh, you know, carved uh, paper and, you know, canvas. And it is produced on site itself. Uh, it's a kind of, they, they are also interested in music, so work with the communities and things like that. Our projects are mostly, this was curated uh, last edition, uh, Shilpa uh, project. Um, uh, this is Blue Cantu. Uh, he is curating the Sydney Binale, right? Uh, his work I have shown in, uh, in June in 2016. Uh, these are the places uh, we converted into a kind of exhibition media. This is Tanish Kapoor, who created it is next to door to this sea uh, um, face. And it's amazing how it is being worked, uh, installed, and produced. So every year we, we make a temporary pavilion. You know, when you think about a Binale, it's actually a temporary uh, a temporary museum project, I would say. Uh, the temporality is very much interested uh, in when we think about a, a Binale. Uh, so this is, this is a temporary pavilion designed by an architect from Tony Joseph and uh, using a different kind of multiple materials. I'll just run through because we don't have much time. You know, this is a public project is done by Gulam Mohammed Sheikh. And also we have this graffiti. When, when we talk about graffiti nowadays, we can see all kinds of stuff, but you know, like a graffiti was a political act, but here it is in 2012, we decided to invite uh, some young people from Delhi and then to work here and you know, many others. Uh, so we have created multiple locations, multiple places, converted this place into a uh, kind of, I, I, won't, I don't want to just call it a kind of graffiti, but it's almost like a mural uh, for the city and beautifying or enriching the city with, uh, with colors and, you know, uh, ideas. So this is uh, by uh, these eminent artists. This is a gorilla girls, their, their posters we have installed in uh, one of the sites. Uh, we, as a foundation, we have, in, when we are talking about the public project, you know, one of the most important aspects is education. Students' Benali is parallel to the main biennial it runs through, and we give our achievement. We work with the fact that the support comes from uh, new groups, we said, uh, Yusuf Ali for this, uh, some of the, uh, you know, like the by name and, uh, you know, we work with the children, the ABC program, Art by Children, and there are many versatiles, you know, Let's Talk is a kind of ongoing kind of thing. It's 365 days of program in some ways that, you know, we do something or the other. We have video lab for young people, they can make their own films, arts, arts and medicine, which every Wednesday we used to perform. I mean, organize uh, musical programs or culture program at government hospital, musical series and collateral program and the curator films, etc. This is one of the talks. And also this is one of the amazing things you can talk about almost like the 40, uh, you know, uh, 4 million people are 4.3, I think, 43 lakhs of uh, uh, members. They have it, you know, this, uh, uh, food industry members in Kerala, this women uh, empowerment and uh, women organization, it's one of the greatest model that we also uh, participated and performed in. So everybody's welcome to our Bainé, you know, here uh, we have a residency program in Pepper House, which uh, this uh, student, uh, Insha Mansur, now she's practicing uh, from Kashmir and uh, she joined for uh, this and also we do this exhibition during the time of the biennial. So it's kind of five months. Now the present biennial is almost like uh, you know, we have extended to 120 days from 90 to 94, 94 to 108. Now it is uh, uh, 120 days. This is a report. There was a study done by Urban Design Collective and KPMG uh, uh, published this uh, report, 166 uh, rising number of uh, tourists visit Kerala since 2006. 
60% biennial visitors are first time visitors to Kerala, 50% increase in business for local traders, 35% hike in business for home stays, 35% rise in uh, foreign tourists visiting between December and March um, since the first edition in 2012. 30% of sales attributed exclusively to the biennial by local business. And you know, these are the studies, you know, like that we published, you know, from 94 artists to, you know, like earlier we had uh, 400,000 people in the last edition after the Nipah virus and it also the flood, the terrible flood happened in Kerala and we could uh, give certain kind of, some kind of uh, spirited uh, misdirection to the local public. And we had almost like the five lakh like, uh, ninety-two thousand people visited in 108 days period. Um, the next edition is curated by Shubhiji Rao. Uh, Shubhiji is, uh, you know, we have announced the Kochi Biennial Foundation announced uh, 25 artists named yesterday to Eflex, uh, and also you can find the names in our. Uh, website put you Mrs. Benale daughter. Uh, this is when we are talking about the public art. I'll, I'll come back to um, you know uh, discuss about this uh, later if you have time. Thank you very much both. Um, Mr. Bob, uh, founder founder partner Start India Foundation, a non-profit organization that comes with a vision to make art accessible to a wider audience by taking it out of con conventional gallery spaces and also embedding it with cities. Arjun, how has START uh, been when able to touch the public and also through its art forms as well? Hi guys, uh, firstly, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, we are incredibly talented people. Um, so I'm honored to be here. Um, just to give a very quick presenta presentation, I had to work really hard to make it really short. There's too much to talk about and we unfortunately or fortunately do too much um, in a year. So Start India Foundation started uh, back in 2014 and it's a nonprofit. Essentially five friends got together and wanted to do something in the public space. And the whole idea was to take art, uh, you know, to make it a little bit more democratic and to get it out of the gallery spaces and make it for everyone. And um, so there's conversation around it as well. So essentially, we, uh, the, the act of uh, Art for All uh, started in 2014. And, um, you know, we also learned, uh, we've never done a festival or things like that. And mostly our initiatives are done through a festival or then city-based projects. Uh, so we've been working over the last couple of years, uh, we've been working in various, various uh, spaces, but somewhere or the other, our work is getting categorized, you know, so we've been working and creating art districts across India, working very, very closely with the Smart City Initiative. Uh, we've been working uh, whenever we get chance and find a really cool location to do some sort of a fun experiential exhibition where it's, it's more experiential, so there's no sale or anything like that, but it's more of a showcase and it literally takes the ecosystem from where it is, be it, be it a container depot next to the largest landfill in New Delhi, or be it um, a, a fishing uh, spot where in the middle of Bombay where no one ends up going, uh, and how we can get people to all these amazing unknown spaces is uh, what we try to achieve from the experiential exhibitions. Then of course, you know, then there are these landmark projects which we uh, try to do, you know, buildings we work with, spaces, locations we work with, which are very prestigious, and try to see how we can interact with art over there. Um, we also, uh, and, and our partner, uh, Hanif as well, works on sign, with sign painters across India. So we, we have a project with sign painters and Bollywood poster painters, I would say, where we try to uh, work with them on documentation of their works because it's a, it's something which is slowly fading away, unfortunately. So we try to document the works as well as try to give it a little bit more, uh, maybe a new life. Uh, we work in spaces of transit. That's very important for us because we feel that the art and the messaging of art can travel uh, somehow. 
uh, and so on and so forth. So I'll just quickly take you through all the projects. Uh, the art districts, we have six art districts. Uh, I'm not in the position to conf uh, show you all. I can only show a glimpse of the Lodi art district, which was the first one which we initiated about three to four years ago. Uh, it's, I would still say it's an ongoing project. Um, it's, it's a very unique space, Lodi art, uh, Lodi, Lodi colony. I don't know, people from India would know, but it's one of the last built colonies by the British. It is homogeneous, so, so the walls are same. It's one of the only uh, pedestrian friendly places in Delhi, I would say. So, uh, you know, and it's non-gated. So you can enter, you can go, you don't need to have a reason. It's, it's that way, it's cool. Uh, and, and, and we started working about three to four years ago over there. After working for three to four years, now we, we've kind of made it into an open museum, um, I would say, an art district of sorts. We have approximately 55 artists who've contributed their works. Uh, try to make it as international as it is possible so that uh, we have a great exchange and a dialogue between the Indian artists as well as the international artists. So we've had about 55 artists working with about 20 different nationalities, including Indian artists who've contributed here. Yeah. There. So some of the works, um, this is, uh, and you know, this is Australian artist. Arjun, um, sorry, sorry, Arjun, can you make it? This Sorry, Arjun, can you make your screen full, full screen? Somebody was asking. Uh, mine is full screen. Hmm. My, my screen is full screen. Would you be able to restart the screen share? Perhaps that might refresh the... I can do that. Uh, there you go. Is that, is that okay? That's perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, yeah, this is an artist from Belgium, Adele. Um, this is a Spanish artist called Borondo, uh, working with great perspectives. And the whole idea is, you know, of, the, of this art district is that essentially the people who live here are, are the government employees. It's, it's their house. It's a government, uh, uh, government uh, flats for senior employees of the government. And uh, it, was, it, it was a place which was almost like almost a thoroughfare. People never stopped, looked. But now at any given point of time, you go to the Lodi colony, which is, which is quite wide. Uh, and there are people who are doing shoots, there are people filming, they are doing these selfies. And it's crazy out there sometimes, you know, it just feels that we created all this art, uh, which has a lot of stories behind it, etc. And it just becomes a backdrop for some, but that's fine. You know, the idea was that, uh, and, and, you know, it's a, also, is, we read a news that it's one of the best places for a pre-wedding shoot, the Lodi Art District. So that was, that was interesting to, uh, here as well. Um, many a times foreign dignitaries come. Uh, we had the first lady of France over here uh, since we work with Institut Francais a lot. So it kind of becomes a spot for them to come and also see the work the institutes are doing along with us. Uh, we had the French uh, first lady and the kids coming as well. Uh, sorry, the Canadian. So somewhere or the other, slowly this is becoming and converging into a tourism spot. You know, the Delhi government uh, is uh, is wants to put it as one of the must-see places in Delhi. So that's great for us anyway. But, uh, and, and we've tried to balance the art out. So obviously the space is such that one side of the Lodi Art District has your very indigenous, your fruits and vegetables and your grocery stops, etc. So over there, we've also tried to do more indigenous stuff. And we've tried to recreate some of it. Uh, yeah, in many, many places. So try to repackage it or try to uh, challenge the artist to maybe do a different skill, you know, uh, like a Madhubani artist working with stencils, which is a great thing, you know, because there's always a learning, right? So we've tried to see if we can contemporize it a little bit without really missing the essence of it. Um, obviously, this can't happen without a great and a strong community involvement. Um, last year, we became really good with this. I would say not really good. I would say we achieved some of our goals. There's a lot of residents who live within the colony, but also around the colony. And the idea was to engage with them even in a more, uh, more realistic way. Uh, so we work with NGOs, other NGOs, and classes, be it workshops, be it dance, art, or painting. And once over the weeks where they did this, we also had a showcase for them. So 
you can just see one image over here where we've showcased some of the works, which was showcased live under the artwork, which was cool. Or we had music performances for them uh, from the Katpatli colony. Uh, or they performed for us after learning, right? So we literally took over the streets uh, uh, and we put two barricades and we took over the streets and just listened to music and, and saw the performance of these kids, which was amazing and enriching for us as well, as well and learned a lot. Obviously they get a certificate so the agenda is not only to integrate them, but also to integrate and maybe put some seeds of, uh, of something different, of creativity. It could be painting, it could be art, it could be muralism, it could be just creative. Some of the people who've been working with us over the last uh, five, six years have really grown and have actually, uh, now they are the ones who do uh, tours in Lodi Colony and we don't, and they know more about the artwork and the inspiration, which is amazing. Uh, we also work with the, with the residents. Uh, we sent about 10,000 uh, questionnaires, which they filled up to see what they wanted in our artwork. So the final theme was, Aham saath saath hai, which means we are all together. So it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your social background is, what your economic background is, but we're all together essentially. And we created one mural with the artists uh, who masterminded it. And then over a period of 45 days, Kids came, colored inside, learned, spoke to the artists, and it was amazing, I suppose. The idea is to try to include people as much as possible. So we created artworks in Braille for some of, for the visually impaired kids. So at least they could feel some of the artworks. And this is this was really, really, uh, really good as well and heartening. And hopefully we should be able to do more with such some, some of our murals going forward. Uh, the second art district, which I just came through because you've seen the essence of what we create, is the Kanagi Art District. It's in Chennai. Again, we only started in March 2020, so literally six months ago. Just before the lockdown, we were still working on this. Uh, and these are some of the artworks over there. Uh, just a few selected ones, I suppose. This is Antonio Maras from Spain. Mm. So essentially, we have a lot of fun. We, we, we you know, we. We, we're a young organization, we're five, six years old, uh, and, uh, and we try to think, think freely. Uh, we try to keep brands away from this as much as possible, even though we need funding, but, but we really try. And, and I would really say that one brand who's really supported us is Asian Paints, who make paint. And they really have believed in our vision, you know, uh, in what we want to do uh, for India. Uh, so this is another example, you know, we had this rickshaw trolley, which is going with paints, almost like when you were buying fruits and vegetables, but we converted it into paint trolley and kids would choose their paints and we would literally take them to the space with these unfinished buildings. So when we played around with the columns and just did some color coloring and some color blocking just to make it fun. And usually these columns, if you see, they dry their clothes over there. So, you know, we try to recreate it and get the playground back a little bit so they can play games in this Kanagi Art District. We did a showcase for all the work which we did for, with the community. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to show all of it uh, as it's too long. But this was Rangoli, a very typical thing which we do in India. And on Mother's Day, on Women's Day, sorry, uh, we created a, a showcase. So the locals showed us their skills, which they rehearsed with, and their dance forms. And then we also got some contemporary guys to do hip hop and b-boying and all of that and so on and so forth. It, it almost became like a concert, right? This was 10th of March. Uh, it was like that, uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, like I mentioned, sometimes you get exciting opportunities to do experiential uh, exhibitions of sort or showcase where we actually have a space. Um, we've done three or four such. Uh, we worked with containers uh, and then we worked at the fishing dock, which was super exciting. I'll be showing the container project. Uh, we worked a little, I would say inside Delhi, but not very, very central. We worked uh, at a place called Inland Container Depot. It's the largest uh, dry port in Asia. Uh, essentially only uh, it, it transports containers on train, train and uh, it's right next to a very big landfill. And we try to work with containers in a more architectural format, essentially. And, uh, and it was, the show was called Work in Progress uh, because as our cities are in progress, even the show built itself over the course of one and a half to two months. So while artists were painting, it was almost like a performance for people to see painting at a scale on painting on odd objects like container 
but it also uh, fostered that interaction between the painters or the artists as well as the audiences. And every week we used to have some sort of a showcase inside the containers along with various, um, I would say, music, workshops, etc. in the central spaces. Everyone had to wear a jacket before entering, this construction jacket. And it was great because soon, when everyone's wearing the same clothes, it doesn't matter who you are once again, right? It's how we're democratizing it. It doesn't matter what clothes you're wearing or not, but everyone's one. So it kind of got that feeling as well into it. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was quite cool to see everyone with one jacket and interacting. And you could see a person from a very low income group to uh, the biggest industrialists hanging out together, seeing the same art, uh, appreciating it, having similar or different thoughts, doesn't matter. Uh, so this is some of the artworks which was there. This is the Mysore Palace. Uh, we did a secret dinner under this, which was cool. Um, some graffiti based poetry or calligraphy, how this artist calls it, really cool. Mm. Yeah. I think we are running short on time, Arjun. I'll finish in two minutes. Okay. Yeah. So we do landmark projects, as I mentioned. Uh, this is our first big project which we did in India, in Delhi. Uh, and uh, essentially, obviously, it was Mahatma Gandhi. We did it in the police headquarters. And they could not say no once we, we, we showed them you're going to paint with Mahatma Gandhi. And it was also opening up a conversation with the administration to really work on this piece and really work on a partnership for the city. Uh, this really opened up the doors for our foundation to do a lot more work in, with the administration. Uh, this was at the church gate station. Um, then, you know, it's not only buildings or facades. We try to be playful as well. We try to work with courts, a basketball court. So if you saw this court before, it was totally ruined. And we cleaned it up. We put asphalt on it. We painted and it became this. Uh, this is in Bombay in Matunga. Uh, now, people actually play there as well, which is amazing. Or this is another court which we did in St. Andrew's School in Bandra. It says boys versus girls. And it's cool. I mean, you know, just having that interaction and having it as site-specific as well, some way or the other can get you back into spots when the space is not being used. At least that's what we've seen. Or the space is not being maintained. Um, we work on installations. We do some fun stuff. This is at Jindal Mansion on Pedder Road. So also, this is an artist called Prithi Luka from UK. We work with cutouts, you know, down south is a culture of cutouts. And we did this in Goa, Auntie Mary, and she went to Paris as well for an exhibition. She was at Love Defense. This was done by Hanif Qureshi, who was also the co-founder. Um, yeah, we do typographic sculptures. And, and we work with sign painters, like I mentioned. So more or less, I would say this embodies the work which we do. Uh, and uh, it's also somewhere or the other urban regeneration, urban planning. We work with all kinds of people. So again, it's 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 a foundation where we uh, it's open to all, uh, and we try to do things for the city and for the country, and which we feel uh, should work, and for the young India as well. You know, because we there are not so many avenues of seeing art, or now it's opened up a lot, but it's restrictive as well in terms of programming, programming and or being invited sometimes to art shows or whatever it is. Yeah, so that's it. Okay, let's get on to the discussion now. Um, the first question I would want to ask to Abdul Rahman, you've been listening in for quite a long time. I want you to join in the discussion. So uh, what we have seen in Qatar is that the leadership has taken an active role in giving public art an outlet. Uh, uh, what are the advantages of this and what are the disadvantages? I would say, you know, everybody might not like uh, to have the leadership's view as a public art, but in Qatar, it has always worked. What are the advantages and disadvantages of, of taking the leadership in public art in Qatar? Well, I mean, I, uh, I, I will have to disagree a little bit. Um, leadership does not, I mean, the way you pose the question uh, feels like, um, leadership dictates what art is going to be in Doha. If no. I may, maybe I misunderstood it. No, what but, I meant was uh, yeah. you have taken the role of uh, you know giving it a push. Yeah. Public art uh, has become much more popular because Qatar museums have taken a, a forward role in it. We understand it more because yes. you are giving it a platform for us. 
uh, it wasn't so before. Mm. Uh, so uh, how has it helped us and how, um, what do you think the disadvantages is also of this is? Well, um, the advantages are pretty obvious. There is advocacy uh, for art. There is a big push. Uh, um, there is uh, empowerment of local artists, uh, bringing uh, more art from abroad as well. Um, changing or opening, pushing the boundaries of what is accepted. Now, one of the positive things is uh, we're pushing the taste of Doha. I mean, it doesn't have to be one unified taste. We, we're pushing the comfort zone a little bit. Um, but um, I would say that's the what some of the advantages. Um, having leadership, um, spearheading the whole initiative, of course, uh, has uh, expedited everything. What, uh, what has happened and it's going to happen, inshallah, in Doha, will need 10, 20 years somewhere else, but leadership have expedited this. Now, I would say drawback on this is kind of a dependency that leadership would always empower and uh, would provide the support. Uh, from the example that um, Arjun, uh, Arjun showed, I mean, it seems like it is very organic, it's community-based, uh, and we, that's what we are aiming towards, actually. We want the community itself to create these initiatives and participate and not really depend on leadership to um, keep pushing. So it's just a temporary incubation period, I would say. We are enjoying the, the, the initiative that the government or the leadership has taken because otherwise, how would we ever get to see such great artists and artwork in the public uh, form? I think, Pahmad, you have the next question. Yes. So um, thank you for first of all, Abdelhaman's help. Um, so in this case, um, with India, the country is too huge and also diverse to have one such all-encompassing agenda on public art. So how has the diversity of the country helped in giving a voice to the public through such public art projects? For example, Arjun. I mean, I think the diversity is uh, is amazing because we we end up working. At, and the intention to go to some of these spaces to work is not to uh, dislocate or gentrify. It is not that. It is to work with the community. Uh, and we end up meeting from uh, communities which are uh, historically either they have been doing fishing or they are the travel community, the Banjaras, or they are a mix of both. Uh, somewhere they did get displaced 100 years ago and they are here now. And, and speaking to them about uh, what are the issues which they are having, right? And what are the, what are the things which we can do in an in a art form? Uh, we are not a political agency, but we would like to think, take things positively as a positive narration to the administration. And if there is a great messaging, we can do in a positive manner. So I think that diversity really works for us because uh, it, it, it allows you to do various things or various projects with different kinds of sets of communities you're working with. And, and we're a pan-India organization, so we don't only work in one space. So we literally have a long research period. We have a long integration period with the community. We have uh, community managers who go and speak to the community, get their understanding, buy-in, uh, where we try to then challenge the artists with site-specific works, thoughts. Uh, and, and therefore, there's a whole range of diverse kind of projects which we suddenly exposed to, which actually is interesting because we can contribute some of these feedbacks to, to, to the administration, to the smart cities, uh, you know, how public spaces are more important for certain kind of communities as well. So I think it becomes an advantage, becomes a knowledge pool, uh, and somewhere or the other becomes a diplomacy tool and somewhere or the other a soft negotiation tool that, hey, why don't we do it like this, or this is a suggestion. Sometimes small fine tuning can make all the difference, you know, uh, and we try to be uh, somewhere or the other between uh, education and, and a conversation channel to, uh, to even an urban art organization which wants to actually create urban art and work on uh, urban issues as well through art. What makes it very interesting is the idea of how 
you also um, are able to involve the community as well to create a joint piece or a um, some fo some form of active uh, push towards that. Absolutely, and as Abdul Rahman mentioned, you know the government of Qatar because I've been there once. I went, I, ju I just went to the airport and I was like, wow, what is this? <laughs> right? You're like, whoa, you know the scale of it, and the detailing, and you're like, it's so good that you guys get that push, right? At this level where it's so contemporary, it's so cutting edge, it's cool. Youngsters understand it. You know, usually what used to happen with a lot of fine art, a lot of people could not understand it. So they got disinterested, right? But there's something which is right there in your face. It's, it looks amazing and it feels art. And then, you know, in small narration, it's great. So that is a amazing push. Unfortunately, we don't have that push or we don't have the level of funding. So we, we try to work with the community, which is our biggest strength and try to, uh, you know, do it. And, and I think organically at some point, Qatar will get it because there are youngsters like us and like all of us who want to do things for the city. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Bose, uh, uh, ha how has government support for the Kochi Binale been helpful in putting the best forward, best step forward for the venture? Do you believe that government or the leadership support is necessary for the success of this uh, public event? How has it helped you? How has it helped the Binale? I think it is. Uh, yeah, we can, can hear you. Hear yeah, we can hear you. Yes. It has been fantastic so far. In like uh, in 2010, um, then culture and education minister was uh, visited. He visited in Bombay. That's the first time. The idea of biennial is also originated in Mumbai. And uh, then since then, in from 2010 onwards, we've been, uh, Kerala has been a huge support for, uh, for the Biennale and cultural cultural aspects of it and how, how public is learned. The people who are not at all aware of the word called Biennale and now everybody is familiar in, especially in uh, Malayalam speaking land and also people started talking about installation and, and everything turned out to be almost like you can desensitize themselves uh, to every every aspect of day-to-day -day life also they see it in uh, some ways aesthetically especially the Kochi uh, The state, when we think about a Denali like uh, ours in Kochi, Kochi Bayanet, we spend uh, Compared to any other, you know, like the Benin's or in Gonzo, they spend almost a 13 million dollar or 13 million euro, which uh, we do this uh, international festival with equally or interestingly, you know, people's participation is one of the major stuff. And uh, we make this happen in uh, three to four million dollar. Um, which is also like in you know, 365 days of work. It's not as I was talking about, not just the Biennale. Um, so we have the residencies as I was mentioning. And also definitely it is happening because of artist community. Uh, they are really uh, hugely supportive towards this festival because there's nothing like this. You know, we used to have a finale and in fact, it was the first final it was started by Inca in 1968. Unfortunately, it fell apart. You know, nothing, we didn't have any other festival uh, of this scale. But there are some of the biennials also, uh, or the festivals also inspired from Kochi to start in other states. So, state is the millions, uh, really HCL. I know Tata and you know, South Indian banks, you know, uh, Asian paint, all these corporate houses also supporting towards the buying. Um, individuals like, uh, you know, the people from, especially, they play uh, an important role when it comes to Kerala. You know? So there's a lot of support, they also come from that part of the land. And uh, for us, it's not, not just because you know 
we cannot do a great project without the help of the people and the people participation, people support is happening there, especially when a state taking an initiation or the state is usually given the freedom to make what we feel like doing, you know, through their support. So we never had any problem of creative problems come from the state. Uh, we have the freedom to do uh, our art making or curatorial freedom we have. We have the autonomy to do the thing. And I'm very happy to see, 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 you know, one by Inspisa, Damien Hurst, or in English, uh, um, uh, Laila was showing uh, Hussein's uh, international project. And unfortunately, we have few few projects happening happen in Bombay, and it's a first point that started some of the public art sculpture initiatives by him. And you know, we have a few people like the Kiran Nader in Delhi, uh, got a huge, you know, she's coming up with a nice, a great museum. And uh, I was looking at the people involved with great projects like in Katka. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, great architects like uh, Jean Novel to, uh, you know, Kool has to, all those kind of people are doing great projects in Qatar. It's, I wish, you know, like Kiran is uh, introducing uh, Sir uh, David RJ is going to make a, a museum for Kiran. That's the kind of, you know, also there is a small, I mean, it's another museum is coming up and in, individual uh, uh, starting in Bangalore. Uh, I wish uh, we had administrative side as well as the government is, you know, putting investment in culture and art. It's very important that is what is happening in uh, I'd like to congratulate people who are involved with it and with me. Alisha and uh, and uh, Mohammed, all of you, uh, you know, taking a, a greater level. And this webinar is also, I think, it is an important one when it comes to its kind of association from a larger continent of democratic continent to a place like Qatar. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, these these associations are important, you know, like. Uh, and for me, public art, when we were talking about public art, you know, there is two kinds I, I see it. You know, like when first I look at the architecture as a kind of public art, you know, like you can also think about, uh, sorry if I'm going away from your questions, but I think it is very much related to the public art. I believe that, you know, architecture play an important role when we think about uh, public art. And also, you know, like small public spaces, you know, a bus stop, for example. You know, I have seen, you know, uh, uh, find very designed uh, some bus stops. The similar manner, some of the uh, bus stops or public the library or places, anything can convert it into a kind of interesting, um, greater, you know, add aesthetic to it, uh, to art and uh, art involvement, artist involvement, you know, sculptors involvement, you know, it makes it amazing. I wanted to show you some of the, you know, few sculptures and few uh, materials I collected for the presentation, if you have time. Sure, sure. This is um, Raul Zurita's uh, sky, uh, sky road. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's a poet, a Chilean poet. Um, in uh, New York, you know, in Queens, he done it in 19, uh, 1982, uh, Raul Zurita. Raul Zurita was also one of the artists in the Chinese's Binali. So this is a temporary public art, I would say that it's a temporary, a temporary project. And this is a five airplanes, aircraft, uh, you know, using um, pure, you know, fumes and creating 
poetry writing on the sky. It's a kind of, you know, now we all about, you know, some of the projects are, you know, contemporary projects are like uh, augmented reality and things like that. Here it is a kind of very temporary public performative, in a way, performative poetry created by, uh, he's one of the greatest uh, writers coming from Latin America. And this is Anish Kapoor, of course, you are familiar. This is Cloud Gate, or people call it in Chicago Bean. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a monumental sculpture. And this sculpture was, a, you know, it was part of this Millennium Project in 2004. Uh, Kapoor unveiled the Cloud Gate in Chicago's Millennium Park. Uh, this is 110. Uh, elliptical archway of highly polished stainless steel. Uh, this project, you know, like it's also, I was reading in 2011, there was, uh, there was a survey published and which was the most photographed uh, work in the world, you know, a monument or, you know, uh, you know like, you know, I was surprisingly, I got to know that, you know, like it is not the Eiffel Tower or Taj Mahal, you know, which is the most photographed work was, you know, uh, was Anish Kapoor. And you can see why there is a kind of participation within the projects itself. In the next door to uh, Anish Kapoor, um, you can see John Plancher. When you create a public project like this, you know, there's hundreds of photographs and from the mouth there is a fountain comes to I mean like it's a kind of their kids will be playing and things like that. So it's an interesting position in where the site and how how curated, how well it is curated. You know, I sometimes I I am a little bit uh, upset with the graffiti projects and things like that, you know, because you know it's never curated, you know, like any kind of colours and tips and you know things like that. It doesn't come as a kind of great, great project. I think it is important to have curatorially noticed and curatorially looked at. You know, of course, it is part station of the, of the local public and the you know, community works are also important. This is a uh, boat, uh, you know, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Christoph uh, Kershwan Museum project. It's a kind of projected. Uh, projected uh, imageries and historically interesting images are, and the narrations he brought into this kind of uh, political as well as the interesting momentary uh, uh, temporal uh, projects are amazing in some ways. You know, like this, uh, he's using lots of projectors. You know, now you can do it in much, much interesting, much, much. You know, this was produced a long time ago. And, uh, and you know, this was the uh, Frank Jerry's uh, Buster I was talking about. So there are many, many public projects you can do, public libraries, public. When you talk about art, it doesn't mean that you're just painting on the wall. And here it is also, you know, it's a temporal work, water temple, you know, created by Sean Don for Kochi in 2018. It's a kind of, you know, like anybody can, it's, it's a frosted glass. It's a kind of rotten room created by, um, by Sean Don for Kochi Dain. And, you know, it's a participation and everyone transform, everyone become an artist in sites like this. Um, yeah, that's it, you know, thank you. And, uh, Thank you very much, Bose. So in this case, when it comes down to public art and, uh, and how it also helps the country have a unified voice of art, Abdurrahman, so how can you be sure of the involvement of the public in these art forms? Yes, uh, I see the question. Uh, um, we do... Uh, Lately, we've been uh, issuing a lot of open calls for the public, um, and it invites all uh, uh, all who lives on on uh, in Doha. I mean, it doesn't go into the newspapers on social media mostly because that's where most people are. But it does also hit the newspapers. Um, I'm not sure what initiatives that came out. Uh, we try to uh, give at least a month or two months uh, 
uh, head start for artists uh, when they see these initiatives. For example, we have the students competition, which was launched uh, uh, a couple of months ago. We have the 6-5 um, blockade anniversary initiative. Um, soon there will be the TOFA, TOFA initiative, which is basically murals. Uh, these initiatives, if, if you want to, if you're interested in participating, just follow Qatar Museums on Instagram or on Twitter and uh, you will see them there. Um, newspaper, nobody reads news, newspapers these days, but you will find them there as well. Thank you very much, Abdurrahman. So, um, this also kind of looks on to the future as well. So, in around 10 years' time, and this, also, this question is also directed towards Leila and Abdurrahman. Um, and everyone else as well. In around 10 years time, how do you feel like public art will progress moving forward, inshallah? Okay, I'll just take uh, the answer. Um, in 10 years time, I think we already achieved a lot in the last 10 years, if you want, as Abdurrahman was mentioned. Um, and I think the culture of um, the art in public spaces have been achieved um, and the value of this artwork also um, is being um, kind of, uh, you can see that there is an interest from the public uh, when the public artworks become a destination, uh, when people drive all the way in the desert to see a public art piece and all the way to Doha to go to a hospital location to see uh, Damien Hirst sculptures, you can see that it's um, the interest, you can see the, um, the value is being embedded in the society. Um, and you can see actually the differences of how people perceived uh, Damien Hirst culture at the beginning versus when we re-unveiled them uh, two, years, uh, two years ago, uh, when, we, uh, when they were installed in 2013, they created a lot of controversy, as we all know. However, two, uh, two years back, with the, the, the hospital uh, Sidra being um, opened, and we re-unveiled them again, um, you can see that people like, really, really got so excited about them. And I said, as I said, they became a destination. So only in the 10 years, um, I can see that the form of public art is being uh, also changed and developed. Um, as you can see here with the, all the guests, um, we have more of um, community engagement. Uh, and when we say engagement, it's not like post-production, but pre-production to have them involved in the selection of the artwork, in the theme of the art. So having them more involved in this uh, area, give them the sense of ownership. And this is what gives the value of the artwork to the public. Um, I see also, as I said, the form of public artworks being more temporary. Uh, so it's can have a, having more of um, event-based uh, public art rather than just like a monumental artwork in the middle of a roundabout. Um, and again, uh, things are changing very fast, as you can see. Um, and I, I see also the digital art is changing the way that we perceive artwork. Now, when we talk about the audience for public art, we don't talk about audience as the physical uh, visitors. We're talking about audiences because people started visiting them virtually. Now we can see in the lockdown how um, museums and art has been visited more and more through these virtual tours. So we're no longer only looking for people physically present in the country to, to see the artwork, but really anyone, anywhere can be sitting in their, uh, in their home and visit the artwork at the same time. I think all these factors are kind of shifting the, the, the public art scene, uh, the way we, we see it, the way we will produce it, the way we commission it. Um, and it's like any, uh, any kind of art, like it's evolving uh, with us as human and it takes from us, we take from them. So I don't know if anyone uh, from the guests would like to add anything. Yeah, I'd like to add. Uh, uh, sorry, my sound was scared. I scared myself. <laughs> um, I, I like to, I like to echo what uh, Leila uh, said. Um, I think we are in a very important uh, period of the history of Qatar. We look back at this period and see, and uh, we'll notice the change. Maybe we're not noticing noticing it right now. Um, I would say 10 years ago, until, I mean, uh, there have been a huge change of the perception of people of what uh, public art is. Um, 
the example that uh, Leila gave about Damien Hurst, The Miraculous Journey, is a great example. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Leila. It was in 2013 when, when it was unveiled for the first time. The reaction was very different. Five, five years from that, um, you have a, a, a generation that was in high school, now they are in college or they have graduated, and now they are a big portion of the community and they are um, cultured in a different way, and there was acceptance. 10 years from now, who knows what's gonna happen? I think it's a great reflection of what the society is, public art, I mean, I mean. It's, a, it's a good reflection. We've seen this change through Damien Hirst, for example, and now um, we've seen it in other topics in, uh, in Doha and in the region, actually. So, yeah, that's just my comment on that. Thank you. So in this case, uh, Leila, so in regards to also your experience, um, been having uh, involved with public art forms as well, uh, do you feel like, as you mentioned, for, for example, like the virtual element and how those are being, are being incorporated, the use of technology as well, do you feel like this might be your next phase or is this just part of the process? Well, I have to mention, yeah, I have to mention that um, we've been um, adding to the collection a lot of interactive artwork, um, more sophisticated, technologically speaking, artworks, um, and uh, we've been learning a lot because, um, from a collection management perspective, when you use to acquire or commission an artwork, you look for the durability of it. And now the, having this digital uh, um, uh, high-tech artworks changed a lot of how we purchase, how we commission artwork, because um, we're talking about systems, we're talking about data, we're talking about connectivity with internet, and these artworks are expected to be working at all time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because this is what public art are, and they have to be accessible at all time. So, um, and I have to say, we, we, uh, we have several um, uh, artwork, interactive artwork uh, that the people were, while passing by, it, it interact with them. Um, and I like to see how people actually get surprised because most of our artworks are either are in unusual spaces. You're not going to a museum to see them. You are going on a business meeting in an in a office building and suddenly you have uh, this encounter with an art piece. Um, and this unusual encounter that we play with, so when the artwork is more interactive, um, it actually capture everybody's attention. Um, so the video mapping artwork that I showed of Munir Fatimi was recently installed in uh, the EC mosque, and you can see people passing by. It's a university slash mosque building, and people passing by, and they look at it, and they stop, they ask questions, they read the description, Public art is all about creating this debates and questions element. So the, and, but at the end of the day, we need to speak the language of our generation, the language of our time. And digital art, it's part of it. We cannot, you know, cop, um, in, in 21st century, of course, painting is still alive and sculpture is still alive, but including the digital art, including high technology art, this is part of it because you are encouraging people to use the technology, to use what has been all the inventions of the last century to be uh, 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 as a different tool to, to, uh, to create art, because this is what makes the diversity of the artwork, is the tool that you use. So the more that you use this uh, um, uh, very uh, contemporary tools, the more that you have artwork that is contemporary and speaks our language. Thank you very much, Leila. <laughs> I think the next question is also from Sindhu. Yeah, I'm trying to share. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So uh, the best example of art being used in conflict to convey messages was evident from uh, June 5th, 2017, when many Qatari artists from the musical, fine arts and theater fields inspired by the blockade crisis used their creative Art, uh, artistic creativity in defending the Gulf nation and showered their love and respect for the 
Emir His Highness Sheikh Tamim Al Thani. Uh, Katri artist Ahmed bin Majid, as we can see. Mm -hmm. Ahmed Majid uh, spontaneously created an iconic image of uh, His Highness the Emir, which became the symbol of Qatar's resistance uh, to regional pressure, and it was reproduced across the nation. Uh, and Qatar, we have been. Uh, recreating or uh, celebrating the blockade uh, in, in many years and recreating works of art uh, like the one which uh, which is a blessing by disguise in disguise by Ghada al Khatir uh, where, where where she uh, uses uh, an art form uh, which says everything is going to be all right in in answer to creeds a blessing in disguise which was uh, available for viewing at al riba gallery so um, can you take us through these moments, Abdel Rahman, and uh, tell us how Qatar created more public art forms to commemorate the anniversary of the blockade? Well, this initiative came um, as a response, of course, to directly to the blockade. Uh, we did not know at the beginning how long it would take, um, how long it would last. Um, but with the, with the anniversary of one year, we thought, you know what, this is part of our history. And instead of hiding it, uh, like uh, I guess in the region, we would use, we'd hide it, we'd hide uh, problems and they surface in the future. We would say, you know what, this is a lesson that we need to learn of. And art is a great tool to learn our lessons uh, and remember. I mean, this is something that other nations do, other uh, cultures do. They remember um, their lessons. Uh, and so, uh, for the first year, uh, we had we installed Ghad al Khatar and uh, Tom Creed, uh, and then we thought, you know what? The second year came, and we thought this could take uh, this could continue. And you know what? Even if the blockade uh, is removed uh, or lifted, we should continue this because it is part of our uh, it is now part of our history. So the initiative uh, was started. The second year we had. Um, we worked with Laila uh, in, uh, in Qatar Foundation and we installed uh, the Berlin Wall in, jo in Georgetown and in, uh, in the, the convention center um, for the third year. Um, of course, we have, um, if I may, uh, uh, installed in the, uh, in, uh, the metro station in, in Sherub. So, um, and that's not all. We have we had support from Ashgal, which is installing uh, another artwork. This is being fabricated. I mean, we passed the, block, uh, the date of the anniversary of the blockade, but we also celebrated it uh, as a reminder uh, on the 6-5 uh, flyover. There was images and photographs of what was produced, the artwork that was produced during that period uh, regarding the, block, the blockade. And it was also projected on the National Museum of Qatar. So it's becoming bigger right now. And uh, we anticipate that this um, initiative will just grow and will continue for the following years. Thank you. Uh, especially the last one that's been, that's shown on the, on the PowerPoint. Uh, it's a beautiful work of art by a French artist based in Qatar and in which he has converted the sound, the, uh, the sound waves of the Emir. And uh, he has used that as a, as a you as a natural looking fossil sculpture in limestone it's a beautiful work of art i hope uh, the cut the rail the rails open soon so that we can see this in person soon um uh, you have already told us about the involvement of the public uh, in the binali mr Bose. D do you think there is a there's an there's a public art intervention center where people are also allowed to create their own art form during the Binali? Is there uh, uh, some sort okay. of a... So there, is, uh, there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, like uh, uh, visitors have a lot of opportunities. One is this ABC art room. You know, the ABC is art by children. You know, so there, uh, anybody can, you know, there will be master craftsmen, master speakers. Um, so you can participate in 
uh, with the kids, uh, you can enjoy. And also we have this pavilion where we have uh, talks every, every day or every evening we have film screening. It's also curated film screening, uh, 108 days, you know, like the last edition, now forthcoming edition, we have 120 days. Out of that, there will be uh, more than 100 hours of uh, curated film screening. So uh, it's also international curators and, you know, like local, um, local uh, performers, as well as, you know, like uh, we, we bring uh, this one series is called the Music of Museries. Uh, there, uh, the cultural performers, you know, musicians, we bring on to, I mean, like, uh, you know, they perform at the uh, temporary pavilion. So the participation is like, uh, it's uh, also this by name or a project like this. Uh, it's an inspirational site we created uh, through the curator's vision. Uh, forthcoming edition is curated by Shubhiji Rao, as I mentioned, which will open, uh, the fifth edition will open on 12th of December. And, uh, you know, of course, we had to look at the situation, you know, um, uh, you know the protocol, health, yes. uh, everything we need to look at it, especially, uh, especially, uh, you know, a by mail place. Is, you know, it is fortunately it is located in the sites are in uh, different places within 4.5 square kilometer area. So there are a lot of walking distances, and also we had to do the scenography in, uh, in new ways of new ways of seeing, new ways of uh, showing. Uh, uh, so that that is also there. You know. So the participation the, in present. Uh, Vinyl, when we think about it, uh, uh, we need to keep that uh, if the situation is like this uh, right now, the physical distancing, we have to look at it. And But we believe in social togetherness. Um, yeah, that kind of uh, thinking we have it right now. Um, so not easy to produce the vinyl in present situation, but you know, like, uh, uh, we, what we can do is give certain kind of, uh, you know, boost to the uh, local, uh, especially the local public to art and culture. And I believe that the, the investing in art and culture will pay off, uh, you know, definitely in future, future generation will uh, get much out of, you know, there are quite a lot of, uh, you know, especially Actually, the tourism, uh, you know, I think, you know, before this pandemic, uh, three major uh, newspapers mentioned the Kochi's one the location to uh, travel into 2020 just because of the one of the main reason was the Bino and in New York Times to um, Geo uh, and you know, Fontenelle and others. So the thing is, uh, we need to create you know, the, this vinyl success is actually the people, it's known as the people's participation, the people's vinyl. Uh, so the, and also the involvement of the government is given the strength to the uh, in, uh, cultural project. So I think you know, what I see in Qatar is already they have uh, visionary, uh, you know, administrators, also the rulers, they are all part of it, you know, so which which is a, the strength of the nation. You know, cultural investment is one of the most important thing, which is, in, when I take it nationally, it is quite other way around, you know, but the state, state, is, state believes in uh, investing in culture. They are building 14 cultural centers in 14 uh, districts of Kerala. So, uh, so this in a smaller ways, you know, uh, but that is, it's also important. So congratulations to all of you people, you know, Apul Rahman, to Laila, to uh, Mohammed. It's really, you, are, uh, you have a lot to do, you can do, because there are huge support from, from your, you know, rulers. Um, and thank you. Uh,
Swim Group for inviting me to be part of this uh, lovely conversation. And uh, of course, my friend Arjun Bal is there. He's <laughs> brought us the working towards this culture building you know, in our own ways. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can we go to the last question? Uh, can we talk about the situation that we are in now? Uh, this is a time where our ability to be in public is lessened due, uh, due to the coronavirus with social distancing norms in most countries where the public space is displaced. It is even more important that we are able to have that space for debate. So how is that possible now uh, when there is no public space as such? How is public art possible? Uh, how does art come to our rescue during uh, crisis like this? Maybe we can, uh, Laila, could you, could you explain on that? Yeah, sure. I think Arjun has something to say before that. Do you like to, oh, uh, to start? I mean, yeah, this is very interesting because, you know, suddenly uh, this pandemic started and we had to stop uh, Chennai and Coimbatore a bit. Mm -hmm. Couldn't finish it. And, and, and we had Calcutta coming up also, so you couldn't finish it. So we, and, and you know, our life is all around being in public spaces uh, from morning to evening. So especially when it comes to our projects and what we do. Uh, and and it, suddenly this just puts a stop in everything, right? Uh, it's like, what do we do? Uh, but obviously with what do we do, there's so many amazing answers which come up, right? Uh, it also brings a challenge to us to uh, rethink and reimagine our projects. Maybe we were doing too much and too fast. Maybe we just had to sit down, relax, and see what we were doing in respect. So obviously that started happening as well. And, 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 and what now we are trying to work is try to do things a little bit different for the next couple of months till we get clarity. So we are working on a digital art festival per se. Uh, we are working with uh, CG artists. We are working with architects, urbanists, uh, to present projects and city projects in a very, very different way. So the public spaces are limited, but we are, we've kind of innovating ourselves. Saying that we also just finished a huge project in Bombay at Mahim station, um, which is very close to Dharavi, which was the heart of the pandemic in, in Mumbai uh, uh, initially. So while we took permissions and did it, and we got the buy-ins, but, but you know, the whole process, if it was a 20 day process of working on site, it became a 30 day process. And, it, and there were so many checks and balances, uh, which we had to do, you know, multiple sanitization, temperature checks of people, uh, making sure, you know, we are following all the rules and regulations, et cetera. So public spaces are being reimagined, be it digitally, uh, and you will hopefully soon see in the next couple of months uh, something something from start as well when it comes to digitally. But at the same time, we are still hoping to go to different cities uh, where we can work, uh, where uh, the pandemic is not so much. Also, some of the works which we do, you know, essentially, uh, it does not create too many people around, right? Because we're working in open spaces. Uh, so it's not an exhibition of sorts where we're gathering people. So many a times we can do the public art stuff and really literally go and then people come and see it and interact with it and all of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does, it does. Maybe we can yeah, hear the other side of it. Yeah. I think I do agree with you and um, um, it's just happening right now and uh, the questions are still there and we really need to look into, uh, we cannot have answers of course for everything right now. We have to, as you said, sit and watch to see see how we are going out from it because the question of when there is no public what is you know the public art um, mm -hmm. uh, how do they exist because artwork uh, needs a viewer to exist at the end of the day yeah. um, and but mm -hmm. as you said we are all uh, kind of we are humans we are resilient and we're known for always being creative and finding uh, you know new ways of uh, of and solutions um, and I think it, there is a lot of examples around the world where, um, where, uh, where the, uh, the public and the artists, the curators, everyone working in this field uh, found a very innovative ways to, to, to showcase the art. Uh, there is a very nice um, um, experience in Berlin, in Germany, where the private spaces became public, which is the balconies. 
uh, where the you know, uh, curators invited the artists to showcase their work on the balcony so anyone can see them. So again, um, uh, the question of public space is, uh, as you said, it's, uh, it's reimagined right now. It doesn't have to be in the street because we are no longer, it's no longer accessible. Um, and I think now there is a whole project of uh, looking into how cities, the urban design of cities is changed because to allow more of physical space, the whole uh, design of, uh, of cities will be changed. So how would that affect the public art locations and, and placement? Um, again, uh, we're, we're sitting, we're watching and we're trying to all uh, uh, provide solutions and I'm pretty sure that we're going to have a great experience out of it and very positive. Thank you, Leila. I'd like to add uh, to what Leila said and what uh, Arjun said. Um, I don't want this to, be, to become a coronavirus conversation, but mm -hmm. I mean, as humans, we are um, social creatures and eventually this would be a temporary um, situation. And that doesn't mean that um, uh, we will go back to the public uh, as normal. Things have changed after corona, post-corona is different than before Corona, but there are um, it, where there are challenges. There are also opportunities. Um, something that is um, was not publicized. We had volunteers that created murals and portraits um, for uh, quarantine complexes, where people were quarantined when, when they come into the country when they leave the country to elevate kind of like the medical therapy or the uh, therapeutic art uh, uh, aspect of it. So we had volunteers created murals. Um, there, was, there were challenges on, on how can they buy the paint? Where can they paint on uh, uh, these murals? They cannot get in touch with anyone else. They cannot be in public. They do not have the space at home. So a scheme was created um, a logistics uh, scheme was created and uh, soon, uh, hopefully, um, these volunteers will have, um, we, we will show at least on our social media uh, what they have uh, contributed to, to, uh, to that situation. Uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman, I scale would yeah. surely like to do a story on that. Sure I'll thing. come, yeah. Okay, um, I think Mohammed, you have the last question then? Yes, of course. Um, so in this case, uh, I also mentioned this previously in one of the questions. Public art, the public art initiative has encouraged many artists to showcase their talents and also send a message across to the public through physical and also digital, digital forms. Many artists also have turned to technology during these pandemic times to also showcase and exhibit their works. You've had digital exhibitions, you've had digital installations as well in this case. Do you think that these digital platforms will be utilized in the future to help push the boundaries of public art? For example, uh, the use of augmented reality, the use of softwares and applications, um, the integration of accessible technology to everyone, so uh, to make it more accessible to the public. And this is directed to everyone in this case. I mean, if you see, um, uh, if you see things like Instagram, or if you see Snapchats, if you see the filters which are being used, or the augmented reality by uh, acute art, uh, it's, it's, it's a very exciting time when it comes to augmented reality and what we can do, you know, and, and creating these filters, you know, you can literally experience the art anywhere. Uh, and, and literally also take a picture and also showcase it with your friend and talk about it. Uh, you know, there are great examples of what cause is done with augmented reality. And I think technology and I think uh, people like Snapchat, which is very big in the GCC countries, uh, I think it's the highest uh, uh, penetration more than Instagram as well. Uh, the, the ease of making the filter is, and the quality of the filter really lends itself to the kind of art which we can be recreated digitally. Um, and similarly with Instagram, you know, it's uh, now Instagram, uh, you know, especially even more dynamic Instagram is going to become. So, and it's cheap, right? It's not very expensive. If you don't want it to be expensive, you can literally do it yourself. So it is more DIY. And I think that's going to be penetrating a lot more going forward. Most definitely. So yeah. can, I, can, I, can I say sure. here something? You know, sure. uh, TikTok is vanished. So, you know, digital is in some ways you can question. You know? 
uh, someone can ban, someone can take it up. So augmented, uh, augmented realities are momentary pleasures, you know, which is momentary, uh, exciting, you know. So I think, you know, the physicality is more important when it comes to a public project. You know, like a public projects, you can, you know, in this period of time, you know, the, your memory box has lot, lot to offer. There is, uh, you know, there are the digital hoardings you can put up your, you don't need to travel and do this, uh, you know, posting. You can, uh, digital hoardings, you can uh, put up your projects. Uh, also, I think uh, it is important, you know, we are also, be, the Kochi Bainan Foundation has also done a project with artists, you know, living artists. We have asked them to provide their stories uh, during the uh, time of this pandemic, you know. So we have posted, uh, you know, almost every day, uh, last couple of months, you know, uh, in our website, uh, we have posted that. Uh, this. I feel this is a very good situation. You can think a lot, you know, think earlier, you know, when we invented uh, photography, people thought it is not, you know, like painting is dead, you know. And now, you know, that, that, that photography considered to be art and other, uh, other art forms as well, you know, later. So time to time, Everything is being keep on changing. I think you know this is also a moment of change. Uh, this pandemic uh, uh, definitely given us for uh, you know thinking about you know rethinking ourselves. You know how how we can create for the future. Uh, I think I think it is really given us some kind of strength to the uh, uh, people's mind. How we can be socially together when the physical uh, presence is not there, you know. So I think, you know, uh, what we are doing right now is a kind of uh, creating another, another location for another site for uh, conversation sites also become uh, aesthetically important. Uh, uh, from these things, I, I learned quite a lot. Um, so that's, and it's, it is momentary as well. I believe it augmented or this digital thing. It's all momentary, but we have to take the pleasure out of it to create for a future, future physical, uh, you know, you know, experiential place we have to create. For that, I think, I think it is important for the extremities. You cannot exist. You know, it needs to coexist in some ways the extremities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Abdul Rahman wants to say. Yeah. Um, sorry, there is some cars here they're driving by. Um, I just want to say that, I mean, in regards of digital art, um, augmented reality, any form of art, uh, at the end of the, of the day, it is art. The question is, is this in public? or is it not in the public space? Um, of course, uh, what is accepted as art, what is uh, trendy, what is um, uh, interesting will change with time as well. Um, now with the coronavirus situation, being at home uh, most of the time, um, even before the corona, uh, coronavirus situation, people have an existence online. And that existence is, you know, is kind of public. That's a, a public domain as well. So I will not uh, limit it to, um, I will not limit it to um, the physical space. I would say the uh, the internet, the cyberspace, uh, is also a public space. Uh, especially, with, let's say, in, on Instagram, if you want to post something, it's going to be you, you can you could have it privately posted or publicly posted. So yeah, I mean. Uh, now we're in, a, in an age where the physical space is an, an option. I think we have uh, already gone beyond our time. There, there has been some very interesting questions, but most of which has been answered also. The, uh, Deepthi, Deepthi Rao had asked whether the Indian government is, uh, why the Indian government is famously indifferent to art that is not traditional. Uh, do you want to take that, Bose? 
both of your work both of you work with uh, contemporary I forms and artists uh, she asked uh, I think you know, it's like more that. of a statement that the indian government is famously indifferent to art that is not traditional both of you work uh, with more contemporary forms and artists how do you make a case for contemporary art that's what that's a question actually maybe uh, in indian i don't know how to answer that question because <laughs> it's opened up quite a bit you know it's not only about traditional I, uh, and i think there's a lot of change because of social media now uh, even from the mindset from the indian government or the or, or, or the decision makers uh, and i think going forward it's it's they've opened up to the idea of different art forms uh, because there has been so much exposure there has been people traveling people seeing how people are interacting and i think that's open a great dialogue uh, and communication uh, as well so there is both indigenous and traditional art forms which are thriving and doing really well there is organizations like us which are urban art platforms which also work with indigenous art forms and which we feel are interesting or we feel we can add value to or create projects with as well so i think uh, uh, it's 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 the, the the administration is becoming more and more mature about it and uh, and they support if i must say we found on of abosa said uh, we found so much support you know and genuine support and genuine uh, people who want to do things and that's why we've come all this way otherwise we wouldn't have actually i think the binali is an answer to the question it has so much uh, contemporary art uh, on uh, display on show both sir you would agree to that i'm sure <laughs> it's actually a kind of uh, it's an example to uh, you know learn from um the binary uh, you know i think you know it is also important to understand you know we have incredible wealth in india i with the 29 states but with the 29 in much more than you know 300 different kind of languages and you know let's take a uh, aspects of india is the wealth of india and it's in it's incredible architecture you know like you take any states you know it's all different from kerala you know kerala architecture is quite different than you know an architecture in uh, agra or architecture in rajasthan it's quite extremely different i think you know this uh, uh, multicultural multi faceted multi Uh, lingual that aspects we should keep it in mind and also we cannot forget about our memory memory means when i talk about memory it means history uh, we have incredible history right so that is that it's actually we call it a tradition or you know like the wealth of uh, you know uh, you know you talk about folk art or you know like uh, craftsmanship and things like that you know, like but the contemporaneity is your contemporary in any way you know you have to grow with the time so you will become contemporary you know today's contemporary is tomorrow's uh, you know mm -hmm. history and memory uh, <laughs> so you call it you know we used to do uh, contemporary work means the tomorrow's question can't say that way. also we can i don't believe as an artist as a curator i don't believe in that and also as an organizer i don't believe tomorrow you cannot predict but if you are predictable then there is no point in doing uh, any project and i believe that you know surprises are the most interesting thing and you take that risk and that is one of the reason i made art also i see art our conversations as well thank you so much to and thank you all of you thank you thank you uh, i think we have come to the end of the session i thank you mr abdul rahman laila mohammed uh, arjun boss thank you for your valuable time and for the valuable insights that you've given us as a closing statement i would uh, putting all this together i would say it's now clear that in any crisis just like the one we are going through public art is an essential form of expression be it decent or to integrate the population through a voice of strong voice of art i think rather than just being addition to the existing practice we should and really try and start thinking about a way to use the digital public art sphere to engage everyone 
even those who wouldn't otherwise associate with art. I think that's a good thing about having the digital public art. So uh, thank you all. I think uh, because of the virus, coronavirus and the lockdown situ situation, we could all sit like this and talk. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not sure scale would have been able to organize this. So I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I hope we'll have some other session like this again. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. It was nice seeing you all.